Hello, my name is Melissa Weiss. I'm assistant professor in medieval Mediterranean history at Washington and Lee University and a Laura de Bossis fellow at Harvard University. I'm here with Professor Gabriele Pedula for the Lauro de Bossis Colloquium in Italian Studies. Professor Pedula is a professor of Italian literature at the University of Roma Tre and a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. Thank you for joining us oh, today. Thank you for the invitation. Okay. So we're here today to discuss your book, recently published in English, originally published in Italian. In English, the 2018 title is Machiavellian Tumult, which is a fascinating new book. Um, I was just captivated from start to finish, and I have so many questions. But let's just get started. What brought you to Machiavelli in the first place? Oh, I discovered Machiavelli when I was in high school, mm -hmm. and like many youngsters, I, I was fascinated. I, I remember uh, the beginning, the big question was, how could this man write both the prints and the discourses, this mm. pro princely treatises and this famous Republican tract, uh, the discourses on Levy. And yes, I was fascinated. So when I studied the lettere at the university, I, 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 I did a lot of Latin and Greek literature, but finally I decided that I want to study Italian literature, and I mean, Machiavelli was a good topic, I mm. thought, and and so I, I this is why I this is how I discovered him and why I decided to work on uh, his treatises. Mm. And just as a follow up, it originally was your dissertation work. Yes, right? it was my dissertation. I, I finished my dissertation in two thousand two. Then I. I mean, I, 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 I wrote other books, but uh, it, 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 it was still there, and somehow I knew that I wanted to uh, to finish it, and so I rewrote it in 2009. The book was published in 2011, and then there were some very positive English reviews, and some colleagues started telling me that maybe I should consider the possibility to have a, an English translation. And I had to rewrite it a lot for English translation because the uh, Italian book was very, very long. It was, I mean, I, I, a real PhD dissertation, very, I will say, German-like, <laughs> <laughs> and very long footnotes. And uh, it was clear that th this was this was not the appropriate book for uh, uh, an international audience. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I cut off the all, all this erudite materials, but but I, 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 I think I tried to keep the, the core and the basic assumptions uh, of the book. And I mean, reworking it was also for me the uh, opportunity to uh, rethink some aspects mm. and to update the bibliography. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy I had to devote more time to this old project. I mean, it is an, a new book, but also a very, a very old one for me. It's such an exciting idea to think about your own relationship with the project and with Machiavelli and how that might have changed over time. You mentioned that you did some updates for the book just in terms of creating it for an English audience and mm -hmm. um, sort of condensing the footnotes. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that you've you've changed your ideas in any significant way in your reading of Machiavelli? Uh, only only one, one single point. There's a, there's, a, there's a very complicated chapter uh, 137 on the Gracchi brothers uh -huh. and the way they uh, they wanted to reshape Roman Republic and uh, I mean I, I think on this point I, I changed my mind mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I slightly corrected the original interpretation of, of the of, of this chapter from the Italian edition to the English one. Interesting. So you really have been in a conversation with Machiavelli oh, yes. for quite some time. He's still there. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> now, I think one of the most interesting things for me to think about um, is that you're not just uh, writing books on scholarly topics. Um, you are also a writer of creative, uh, creative. you do a lot of creative writing. Um, mm -hmm. And so you've published uh, your first novel in 2017, mm -hmm. right? And a collection of short stories in 2009. Mm -hmm is very compelling. How do you view your re the relationship of your work as a historian with that kind of creative writing? I, mean, I think I have a double life. <laughs> 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 but, uh, n m may I mean, there, there are some elements of contact that this is, this mm. is clear. I will say that when I try to 
uh, write my scholarly essays or, or books. I never forget that they have a, I mean, a readership uh, uh, which could be interested in, in the way I write. I mean, the, the, mm. I, I think that uh, literary criticism uh, 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 is part of literature, so mm. I, 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 I I I tend to be a, a, style, a stylist at mm. least at least in, in Italian. I, I I've been told that the translation is pretty good, but I I, I mean I, I cannot judge it, uh, of it, and and so I uh, maybe this is the bridge uh, which connects uh, these two lives. Mm. Uh, on the other side, I will say that I. Uh, Compared to many other uh, writers, I don't feel the necessity to uh, make um, strong aff- affirmation explicit in my in my fiction books because mm-hmm. I, I have my uh, I, the, the other side of my creativity to say mm-hmm. uh, things in a direct way. So I. I uh, I, I, I prefer to, um, I mean, I go for a, a less a, a explicit way of writing when, I, uh, when I'm a fiction writer. I mean, I, th- th- this is maybe the most important thing to me uh, as a writer. You, I mean, the, the, the real, the real uh, meaning of the text is under the text somehow. Mm-hmm. And you have to look closer. And I mean... I, I, I love engaged readers uh, who don't li- limit themselves to the, to the surface. Well, that's wonderful. And you can really see that come out in the way you've crafted um, the scholarly text oh, as well. You. It's really wonderful. Um, so I wanted to jump right in and ask you a question about the sixth chapter of the book. One mm-hmm. of the most interesting things that you do, um, you, you argue quite convincingly that Machiavelli's source for a positive interpretation of both um, the Roman tumult as a creative force in Roman politics and his insistence on the mixed constitution uh, in terms of, of governance didn't come from Polybius's histories so much as from Dionysius of Halicarnassus is Roman antiquities. It's it's quite a convincing argument. But one of the things that you draw out draw out is that Dionysus is quite overlooked today. People don't mm-hmm. read him uh, quite as much. Whereas for Machiavelli's contemporaries, he was quite re- well read. Um, so that leads me to ask, well, how did you come to Dionysius? Uh-huh. What led you to that text um, and to put that puzzle together? Um, and And in particular, was it just serendipity? You you talk about Machiavelli talking always about the luck of the gamble, Mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. as as a constituent part of political life. Um, Was that what happened with you and Dionysius, or or how did it come about? Uh, You know, I I was very systematic. I mean, uh, um, at a certain point, it it became clear to me that Machiavelli Machiavelli writes this uh, this expression, I, I want to say something against the opinion of the many. Mm-hmm. And at a certain point, it, it became pl- clear to me that Machiavelli was thinking of somebody in particular. Uh, Machiavelli uh, is stating that conflicts are were good for, uh, for Rome. He said that Roman Republic became free and powerful be- because of social conflicts between the plebeians and the patricians. So uh, this daring and, I mean, controversial I- idea uh, seemed very interesting to me. So I, I wanted to understand where does, does it come from? I mean, because mm-hmm. it, it is clear that Machiavelli was engaging uh, sort of polemics with a target. Who was this target? I, I wanted to understand it. And, and I thought so that the only good thing to do uh, was to read uh, the greatest number of ancient sources. And I, I did it also because, I, I mean, I, I thought that it, it was a very re- rewarding reading in itself, of mm-hmm. course. And, and, and so I read um, all the classic historians, and they relate in my research when I was finishing my, my PhD, I, I bumped into Dionysius of Alicarnassus. I mean, uh, he was on my list because he wrote this alternative history of Rome. I mean, uh, a completely different narrative compared to uh, Livy, but there was n- no 
uh, Italian edition in commerce at that time and uh, in the famous French uh, collection Budet, there, there was not a translation as well. So I, I had to go for uh, the English Lub edition. Mm. And I was a bit lazy. You know, I had to <laughs> read all these pages in English. Uh, and, 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 and so uh, I, I only... Mm, I, I came to Dionysus very late uh, in my PhD research. And then I discovered how important it was. So I... Eventually, I published a couple of articles mm -hmm. in Italian, and in 2010, I edited a, a new Italian edition of the discourses. Uh, the discourses, sorry, the, the, the antiquities by uh, by Dionysius, uh, and, I, and I tried to understand why Dionysius was so important at Machiavelli's time, and then why he was forgotten. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, during the 18th century, I would say that there was a, a, a big uh, paradigm shift. I mean, the historians started asking if all these wonderful stories about Rome were reliable. And as mm -hmm. uh, Dionysius uh, uh, tend to be very uh, full of, how can I say, uh, details, uh, he became unreliable somehow. And mm -hmm. he was a, a bit forgotten compared to Livy or Polybius. In line of, with this wide reading that you did, and I think it's fascinating that you came to Dionysius so late in the dissertation process. Um, I think that that happens to many of us, uh, that, <laughs> that you never know <laughs> when you're going to encounter something, th something and then all of a sudden your project changes. Exactly. Um, so that's, that's gratifying to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that that speaks well to the method uh, with which you approached this project. Um, the wide reading that you bring in not just the traditional sources, putting yourself in conversation with political theorists and intellectual historians, um, whom you you know very rightly critique for their their readings of, of Machiavelli, but you're also reading so many of the contemporary texts, uh, text contemporary with Machiavelli, um, and so that leads to this really important contribution of the book, which is to situate Machiavelli's novelty um, in thought as a part of an exercise in method, right? So um, it's not just the content of his thought. The reason his content, the content of his thought can be so new is because of the method he chooses to present it. Namely, um, you say that the discourse's modernity consists first and foremost in Machiavelli's choice for a different canon of reference by which you mean he's not looking at philosophy, he's not looking at Aristotle to explain politics so much as he's looking at histories like Dionysius of Halicarnassus. Um, and so he's, he's changed his, his body of, of reference and he changes his method of writing. He uses the discourses form, mm -hmm. which again is quite new. Um, and you say that's, that's, that's where this generative moment comes in and what's new in Machiavelli. And then you brought in this wonderful term, um, I hope I can pronounce it, philosophistoricus, uh, which is the term that Jean Baudin uses for Philo the Jew to speak about this particular way of doing um, history or politics or philosophy, right? Um, and so I, it made me uh, just think a lot about your own method mm -hmm. and about Machiavelli's method. Um, in, in order to explain it, you coined the term Political classicism. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about what that is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, thank you for uh, asking me this question. I, I, I think you really got the point. I mean, for me, uh, the, 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 when I was writing this book, it, it became more and more clear to me that I was maybe identifying myself with Machiavelli's method. I mean, the idea that he, if you want to discuss uh, theoretical questions, history can be your best ally mm. somehow. And I remember at a certain point I was reading this wonderful Italian historian, Arnaldo Momigliano. Um, he wrote that um, the Italian tradition, he said, is Machiavelli plus uh, uh, Vico. Uh, and, and, and Vico, uh, what meant for him th th this idea that you have to uh, built a philosophy putting to, uh, together the verum and the factum. The factum is the history and the verum is I mean, the, 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 what you know about the way my 
it works on I mean all, all the philosophical side mm. a, a, a philosophical s- uh, side plus uh, an historical side and, and only when they merge you can see things correctly and I remember how to, oh this w- uh, this is what I may be doing this is what I what I'd like to do I mean using uh, this uh, historical materials to uh, uh, build uh, also a theoretical reflection on uh, such hot topic mm-hmm. as, as conflicts. And when I use the, this expression, uh, um, classicismo politico, political classicism, I wanted to uh, make clear how uh, Machiavelli's attitude towards the ancient was different from the humans, for instance. Mm-hmm. I mean, for the for the humans, the problem was to uh, write a, a continuation or a new version of ancient political or, or moral uh, theory. Uh, for uh, for Machiavelli, uh, the lessons of Aristotle or Seneca or Caesar was not that uh, interesting in itself. Machiavelli uh, was more uh, looking at the uh, practical lessons of the of the Romans, and the only way you could learn about them was reading uh, historians, not ancient philosophers. And this is the reason why he uh, decided to write the discourses on Livy, and uh, the reason why he used uh, Dionysus of Alicarnassus so much in uh, uh, his tract. And I think you you sort of pick up on that spirit in the way that you approach this work, right? Mm-hmm. Reading Machiavelli alongside other histories mm-hmm. and, and what the humanists are doing there. Of course, putting in conversation with philosophy, but um, it, was, it was quite striking. Uh, and so I just had to wonder, do you feel a sense of kindred spirit? <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, uh, as I told you, yes, I, 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 I'm, I'm happy you... you you got this point because I, it was very clear at a certain point for me that I, I was uh, somehow uh, moving in the footsteps of in the footsteps of Machiavelli. Mm-hmm. I, I, I remember many years ago I read a wonderful book by Robert Harrison, who's professor of Italian literature at Stanford, mm-hmm. and at the beginning of his book he wrote. Uh, 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 we don't need uh, an interpreter for uh, Vico. We need uh, somebody uh, who follows in his footsteps. And I, at a certain point, I thought, oh, maybe I, I, I should write something like this about Machiavelli. But then it wasn't true for my for my book because I, I was also interpreting Machiavelli. But there was also this idea that. Uh, uh, probably Machiavellian project is an unfinished project, and I will bring a little brick to the still uh, in process uh, wall. It's <laughs> wonderful. Um, so one of the, the things I noticed in the book, of course, is that it, it speaks not only to historians like myself, um, but of course to political theorists and in, in the contemporary sphere. Um, and so many of the interlocutors that you have within the book are, um, are modern political scientists and political theorists. And you, you discuss how you, you hope that Machiavelli can still be um, useful to us today. So um, in that vein, you situate yourself uh, not as uh, as against your interlocutors who might be reading Machiavelli either as a populist mm-hmm. um, thinker or um, as oh my gosh constituent constituent thinker yes um, so his readers who would who would uh, label him as a constituent thinker as a populist thinker and you say no he's an expansive an expansivist thinker right mm-hmm. that he reads the expansion of the state. Of the Republican state as something that's got to be tied to an expansion of political participation in that state, um, which is really interesting. Um, and today we'll be putting you in conversation with one of those main interlocutors, mm-hmm. John McCormick, who um, you've said is is forwarding this populist reading of mm-hmm. Machiavelli. Um, and so I know that this is not the first time that you two have been in, t- in public conversation. So I think we're all very excited to see mm-hmm. that interview today. But I noticed that the final footnote in the English edition, you mentioned that you 
you you feel close to the spirit of some of McCormick's proposals. Um, and I'm just curious, since this this is a book on conflict, um, and you will we'll be seeing some of that today, how do you characterize the nature of your relationship with John McCormick? Is it conflictual? Are you um, collaborative? Perhaps not consensus building, but <laughs> <laughs> tell me about that. Oh, I, I, I will say that we are, we are very close. Mm-hmm. I've known John for maybe six years now. And we, I mean, we, we, we became really good friends. Uh, he, he comes often to Rome. So, I, I mean, we had the opportunity to share our views on Machiavelli. I, I, I can tell you that uh, when I first read his book, w- which was published the same year as mine, uh, I found it, it was really incredible how close we were. Mm. Uh, and the, the, this is very interesting because uh, on the other side we're very different. I mean, we, because we have different backgrounds. I, I come from intellectual history, literary history, and he comes from political theory. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I really admire the way he goes straight sometimes. I mean, I, 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 I need to have a, a lot of little proofs to build my arguments but it seems that he, he he takes completely different paths and then we surprisingly uh, reach the same conclusions i mean it, it is really surprising for me this is uh, when i when i read this book i was mesmerized and i, I thought oh look this is uh, the fact that we are so close and also so different uh, can be a sort of a precious uh, stimulus to do things together because I, 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 I see that when we reach the same conclusions or conclusions very very very, very similar um, uh, we are uh, taking paths so different that this is maybe a sort of confirmation that we are right or uh, I mean that uh, my arguments can uh, get improved by uh, sort of um, uh, cross readings of what we are uh, writing and, and, and doing. I think it's a wonderful testimony to the value of interdisciplinary work. Oh, yes. Um, and also to the value of the personal relationships that can exist in the academy, uh, this relationship that you've had with John McCormick for what sounds like quite some time. Um, and and hopefully it's also an indication of the value of your individual contributions coming from such different fields, um, and that those contributions could be read widely in the academy and hopefully beyond. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for joining us today and for giving us the thank time you. and opportunity to ask you these questions. Uh, thank you for joining us, our audience, at the Lauro de Bosses Colloquium in Italian Studies.